Good afternoon and welcome. It is my honor and my privilege to be here this afternoon to share with you the history of Prince Hall and Prince Hall Freemasonry in America. I am the Reverend Dr. William Lewis Rocky Brown III, Worshipful Grand Chaplain of the Most Worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania. And I'm excited about sharing this opportunity with you. We often talk about origins and the story is told when we think of the word origin of a little girl who went to her mom and dad to ask them where did the human race come from? And so she went to her dad and her dad said, well, there was this big bang theory and there was this thing called evolution and, we, and the human race developed from monkeys. So she went to her mom and asked the mom the same question. And mom said that, uh, no, the world was developed because God created man and woman. So the little girl was confused and she said to her mom, mom, I'm confused because dad said we came from monkeys. And the mother said, daughter, it's easy to explain. You see, dad was talking about his side of the family and I was talking about my side of the family. Laughter is good for the soul. And so we've come today to talk about origins and the beginning of masonry among African-Americans. But before we do that, we've got to talk about the man who started it all. Who was Prince Hall? And what is Prince Hall Freemasonry? Even among those familiar with Freemasonry and even occasionally among fellow Freemasons, an aura of mystery surrounds the Masonic tradition Prince Hall founded. Part of this aura comes from the perspective or perception held even by many fellow Masons that Prince Hall Freemasonry differs significantly from what we would call normal Masonry, practicing special rites and ceremonies and adhering to a different set of core values than those held by other Freemasons. This perception is completely incorrect. Prince Hall Freemasonry is simply a branch of, of the larger tree of Freemasonry and members of Prince Hall Lodges believe the same things and conduct the same ceremonies as their fellow Masons around the world. But it is a perception that has proved to be surprisingly difficult to dispel. You see, one reason might be that the history of Prince Hall Freemasonry differs from that of Freemasonry because Prince Hall Freemasonry is young compared to the Masonic tradition begun in England and Scotland in the 16th century and which according to some sources dates its origin back as far as the 14th century. See, young is a relative term in this case for Prince Hall Freemasonry is approximately as old as the United States of America. Now, according, or let me and I say, adding to this mystery is the fact that Prince Hall Freemasonry has largely existed apart from the mainstream Freemasonry, owing to the racial codes and legal restrictions of the United States. So a mysterious sense of difference comes to mind, even among committed and otherwise knowledgeable Freemasons when Prince Hall Masonry is mentioned. Now, perhaps the largest part of the aura of mystery that surrounds Prince Hall Masonry, however, is simply how little is known about the man himself. Although Hall today is widely recognized as the father of Black Masonry in the United States, few records or papers pertaining to his life have been found either in Barbados or the Caribbean, two places where Hall is believed to have been born or in Boston where he spent his life in America. Indeed, there are far more rumors concerning Hall's life than there are confirmed facts. 
One widely circulated account claims that Hall was born free in the British West Indies to an English man named Thomas Prince Hall and a free colored woman of French extraction. Prince Hall was born between the dates of years of 1735 and 1748. Now, I know that's a long span of time, but we cannot seem to actually find papers that tell us the exact date. We know that the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts has picked 1748 because it is placed on his tombstone. But his place of birth and parents are also unclear. Prince Hall mentioned in his writings that New England was his homeland. The Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Massachusetts and its proceedings of 1906 opted for 1948, relying on a letter from Reverend Jeremiah Belknap, a founder of the Massachusetts Historical Society. Prince Hall's birthday is traditionally celebrated on September the 14th. Now, Hall's earlier years are unclear, but they say you tell us that historian Charles H. Wesley theorized that by age 11, Prince Hall was enslaved or in service to a man named Boston, a man, a Boston tanner whose name was William Hall. And by 1770, was free and a literate man. It is with it was through William Hall that Prince Hall learned how to process and dress leather. In the book Inside Prince Hall, author and historian David L. Gray states that he was unable to find an official historical record of the manumism, meaning the freeing of Hall. Hall, identified as able to read and write, may have been self-taught or like other enslaved people and free Blacks in New England, he may have had insistence or was taught to read. But in 1765, at this, at this account has it, Prince Hall worked for his passage on a ship to Boston, where he found employment at, as a leather worker a trade he said to have had learned from his father. Within eight years, Hall had acquired real estate and thus was qualified to vote under colonial laws of that time. Religiously inclined, Hall later became a minister in the African Methodist Episcopal Church with a charge in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And as we talk further, we'll see how his connection to the African American African Methodist uh, Episcopal Church played a part in the development of Prince Hall Masonry in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Another historian, Charles H. Wesley, has put forth the widely accepted theory that Hall was indeed a native of New England and a slave to Boston Tanner, William Hall, but was freed in 1770. However, it was exactly that Prince Hall came to America and gained his freedom. He had certainly obtained both by the early spring of 1775, because this is when Hall and 14 free Black men were initiated into what was become known as the founding of Black masonry worldwide. The historic initiation was carried out in Boston at what is now Fort Independence on Boston Harbor at the Irish Constitution Military Lodge number 441, a Masonic Lodge attached to, to the British Army forces stationed in Boston. Along with Hall, the 14 other new Masons who were initiated that day were Cyrus Jonbus, Benston Slinger, Prince Rees, John Canton, Peter Freeman, Benjamin Tiller, Duff Reform, Thomas Sanderson, Prince Raiden, 
Canto Spain, Boston Smith, Peter Bess, 14 Howard, and Richard Tidley. When the events of the Revolutionary War forced the British Army to leave Boston in 1776, Lodge Number 441 granted Prince Hall and his peers the authority to meet as African Lodge Number 1. It was a first significant step toward the full autonomy and eventually recognition for these African-American men as Masons in their own right. The members of African Lodge Number 1 were permitted to participate in Masonic procession on St. John's Day and to bury their dead as a lodge, but were not permitted to confer degrees nor perform any other Masonic work, therefore stymieing their ability to add new members and for the lives to grow. But despite these prohibitions, for the next nine years, the Brothers of the Lodge, together with fellow African-American Masons who have received their degrees elsewhere, would assemble and enjoy their limited privileges as Masons, meaning to perform charitable works and to enjoy one another's company, just as did Masons the world over. By January of 1779, records show the roles of African Lodge number one had more than doubled, with 33 Masons listed on the Lodge's historical documents from that period. Several years later, on March the 3rd in 1784, Prince Hall took the next step towards autonomy for African Lodge number one when he petitioned the Grand Lodge of England for a warrant and was granted the warrant or charter, thus establishing African Lodge number one's legitimacy in the eyes of the world's foremost Masonic organization. This petition, along with Hall's decision to form an independent, fully warranted lodge, marks the origins of Prince Hall's Masonic fraternity, nearly as decisively as Hall's initiation with the 14 other brothers into masonry. By accepting its new title as African Lodge number 459, which it became of Boston, as Prince Hall's Lodge would subsequently be known, the Lodge took up a more permanent and secure position within the world of Freemasonry. Indeed, the warrant to African Lodge number 459 of Boston is the most significant and esteemed document known to Prince Hall Mason's um, fraternity. It is on this document that we as African Americans hold our legitimacy. In fact, there are brothers who, pil who take a pilgrimage every year to Boston to participate in Masonic activities at African Lodge number 459, and some of them have actually become members. The warrant was granted on September the 29th, 1784, and delivered in Boston on April the 29th, 1787, by Captain James Scott, the brother-in-law of John Hancock, signer of the Declaration of Independence, captain of the ship. The, the ship was called the Neptune. Under the authority of this one, Prince Hall's Lodge was organized one week later with African Lodge number one becoming African Lodge number 459 and its opening doors as fully sanctioned Lodge happened on May the 6th, 1787. Now this charter granted to African Lodge number 459, incidentally, is of great historical significance, not only to Prince Hall Masons, but to all American Masons. You see, the document which is authenticated and in safekeeping is to believe to be the only remaining original charter issued by the Grand Lodge of England that is in still possession by any lodge of any Masonic body here in the United States. 
The fact that African Lines number 459's charter is still under Masonic possession is, is even a, more of a miracle because in 1869, a fire destroyed the Massachusetts Grand Lodge headquarters, completely consuming a number of priceless records and documents. In this perilous situation crawled a grandmaster who was named S.T. Kendall, who entered the burning building at the risk of his own life and saved this charter from the fire. Today, the African Lodge number 459 charter, 459's charter is safe and secure between heavy plates of glass and is stored in a fireproof vault in a downtown Boston bank. Some seven years after Lodge, African Lodge number 459 received this charter, Prince Hall's leadership in the Masonic fraternity was recognized more widely when in 1791, he was appointed provincial grand master. Thus, this designation allowed Hall to support fellow Masons in their bids to establish new lodges of their own. It was this authority that would be instrumental and spreading black masonry across this young nation. The first fellow Mason whom Hall was able to help was a young man by the name of Absalom Jones of Philadelphia, an ordained Episcopal priest who was interested in opening a Philadelphia Lodge. Under the authority of the charter granted to the African Lodge of number 459 of Boston, assisted by Grand Warden Cyrus Forbes and George Middleton of African Lodge of Massachusetts, Prince Hall established African Lodge number 459 of Philadelphia on March the 22nd, 1797, in effect, sponsoring Jones's new lodge. Philadelphia was highly significant in the development of Black Freemasonry in the United States, perhaps nearly as important as Boston. Over the next several decades, Hall and the Massachusetts Grand Body would go on to establish more lodges in the city. Union Lodge was founded in 1810, Laurel Lodge number five in 1811, and Phoenix Lodge number five in 18, and number six rather, in 1814. Prince Hall passed away on December the 7th, 1807, at the age of 72. His body is buried in Boston's historic cops hill burying ground, along with a number of pro prominent colonial era Bostonians. The grave of Hall's wife, Flora, is directly behind his near a large tree. Marking Hall's grave is a broken column, as you can see, those of you who are online, erected 88 years after his death by the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Free and Accepted Masons of Massachusetts. As masonry for Blacks and Whites expanded in the United States, larger changes were afoot in the wider Masonic world. In 1813, the United Grand Lodge of England struck all American lodges from its roles. But this decision also provided American Masons, and in particular, African-American Masons, were for push towards independence. Meeting on December the 27th in 1815, a group of distinguished Masons affiliated with the Philadelphia Lodges, known as Past Masters, together with Absalom Jones, erected the first African independent, independent Grand Lodge of Free and Accepted Masons for and in the jurisdiction of North America. Reverend Jones was elected right worshipful grandmaster of the new Grand Lodge, 
the new Grand Lodge known as first independent African Grand Lodge of North America would later go on to be formally declared its independence from the England, English Freemasonry as a whole in 1827. Found the example of a number of other American Masonic lodges that had done so. Uh, also, I had mentioned earlier that in the formation of the Grand Lodge in Pennsylvania, there was a connection from where um, Prince Hall was a minister in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. The founder of that church was Richard Allen, who also became a master mason and was when the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania was erected. The uh, founder of the African American, uh, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, Richard Allen, became the first treasurer of the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania. In the meantime, the tradition of Freemasonry established by, by Prince Hall spread slowly westward. In 1827, out of respect for their founding father and the first Grand Master, Prince Hall, the Grand African Grand Lodge changed its name. Black Masons in the United States and in time around the world would thereafter be members of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge. Though the Lodge maintained its independence from the United Grand Lodge of England, it turned out that the Prince Hall Grand Lodge was not quite done with the United Grand Lodge of England. In 1946, the United Grand Lodge of England granted recognition to Prince Hall Grand Lodge and then withdrew it a little later that same year. But in 1994, the United Grand Lodge of England dealt with them in such a way that they gave them official recognition as the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Massachusetts for a petition that they had sent over 200 years ago. In the 212 plus years of its existence, the Prince Hall Grand Lodge has spawned over 44 other Grand Lodges. Today, Prince Hall Fraternity has over 4,500 lodges worldwide, forming 44 independent jurisdictions with a membership of over 300,000 Masons. None of this would have been possible if it not, were not for the brave and tireless efforts of Prince Hall. Even today, more than 200 years after Prince Hall's death, Masons from across the nation and the world can be seen approaching Hall's gravesite to pay homage to him, to the man who made their Grand Lodges possible and gave him or gave them his name. Every year in September, Prince Hall Day is celebrated here in Pennsylvania among African-American Masons and Amer African-American Ma Masons throughout the world. I have participated in those services since I have been a member over 30 something years. Even this weekend in Philadelphia, we had the Prince Hall Shriners here celebrating their convention for a week where we had Prince Hall Masons who happened to be Shriners here from all over the world. And so I'm happy to have had this opportunity to share with you a brief history of the um, history of Prince Hall and Prince Hall Masonry. Um, parts of this lecture I'll share with you have come from a, a body of work by a Prince Hall brother named Warren Hawk. It's entitled Prince Hall Freemasonry, The Secret Within. Other aspects of this lecture were obtained from Wikipedia and various internet articles. I hope I have enlightened you, given you some Masonic light and history as to Prince Hall and Prince Hall Masonic fraternity. 
We thank you for this opportunity and that you thought it not robbery to share with us. And we pray that one day we might meet those of you who are brothers face to face and be able to converse and meet on the level. God bless you and thank you. And please, whatever you do, remember this pandemic is not over. So please be safe. I encourage you personally to get a vaccination and to wear masks so that we can provide safety for our families and one another. God bless you and have a good evening.